If you have your Bible open to Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter 2. I've been talking about what it means to be in one accord. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about one accord in the way. Now, this is kind of a special day for me because January 15th was the day that I was ordained into the ministry. So always special. Uh, of course, that was more than a year ago. Um, my, my dad got to be a part of it. I had two uncles that could be a part of it. Uh, my brother could be a part of it. There was a the church that uh, um, when we left Florida in 1966 to come to Georgia, yeah, I was born in Florida, but I got here as quick as I could. <clears throat> uh, the church that my dad took was called uh, Antioch. And one time uh, when I was a, a teenager, my dad had resigned to church and um, we were kind of between churches. So we went back to that church and uh, that church uh, was really the first church that ever saw me as being Brian and not Alton's son. Um, from the time I was my earliest memories, even going to the barber shop when I was a kid, and they'd have to put that board across the arms of the board. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all men, when you're a little kid, you had to go in there and you had to sit on the two by four across the, the, the arms of it, the barber's chair to get your hair cut. They always called me Little Preach. And I don't know why other than they were just picking fun at me again. I had a big mouth, probably. But uh, that was the church that we went back to. And they, they loved me. And they, um, they, they saw something in me that... <laughs> Only God saw in me. And I'm grateful that uh, they, they let me be who I am. And they, when I was 18 year, years old, I was made a church training director. Y'all remember that? When I was 19, I was a Sunday school teacher. When I was 20, I was a Sunday school director. I served on about every committee that church had, except finance. Praise God, hallelujah, amen. I was even on the search committee one time, a pulpit search committee. But that had a unique uh, twist to it as well. But God's done a lot for me. And I just want to say all that to say this. I'm very grateful that God sees things in us. And God loves us. And God creates us for a purpose. And the purpose is never about us. The purpose is always about other people. And I'm honored to be your pastor. And I'm honored to be able to serve the Lord today. And uh, today when we look at this scripture, this is here in Acts 2. This is the inauguration of the Holy Spirit into the lives of these people who were believers. It is what we would call the beginning of the church. And they were told to wait for the promise of the coming. The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. And Jesus had told them, you can't do this on your own. But I promise I will send the Comforter, the Paraclete, which literally means the one that will come alongside. He will come and be with you. It is Emmanuel, God with you. He says, I will send my spirit to be with you. And I'm very grateful that he has. He is a friend that's closer than a brother. He is always a whisper away. He knows everything about us and loves us completely. And he, he is the, the chair of the cheerleaders of our heart. He just wants so much for us. He wants to bless us. He wants His peace just to overflow us. He wants us to be drawn to a joy that we desire in our heart. And yet there's a conflicting thing that is there that keeps us many times from having it. Now this group of people that we see in Acts 2, they were called disciples. They would come to become apostles, some of them. They were people who had followed Jesus for two, three, some three and a half years in Jesus' ministry. And they knew Jesus, but they were not fully aware of everything that was about Christ. They knew His love. They saw His love, but they had yet to have that love flowing through them. They knew His peace, but they were still controlled by the worries of the human spirit. They heard his wisdom, the great messages that he preached. 
but they had yet to hear that wisdom for themselves by the whisper of the Holy Spirit to their heart. They saw the walk that Jesus had with God, but yet they had not learned yet what it meant to walk by faith and not by sight, to trust in God and God alone. And here on the day of Pentecost, as they were in one accord, in one place together, God knew it was time. It was something that He had planned before the foundation of the world. And it was time to pour out His Spirit on the believers. To pour out His Spirit on them. In Acts 2, verse 17, look what it says. Here, Peter, who is preaching this sermon as he's trying to explain what was going on, he quotes Joel, the book of Joel in the Old Testament. Acts 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. On my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. Look what it says in verse 33. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. This is speaking about where Jesus is now. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. He poured it out upon them. Let's pray. Father God, we have heard of the Spirit of God. We've heard sermons and preaching. For those of us who've come to know you as Savior and Lord, we have heard the the leadership, the conviction, the encouragement, the leading, the help. You have been our comforter. You are the one who stands beside us. But I pray, O Lord, today that we could kind of understand this great gift of the Spirit that You've given to every believer. And Father, we are nothing without You. But Lord, I pray that we don't take you for granted, but that, Lord, we would desire the anointing, not settle for anything else, but the anointing from above. That we would not live a life of calling ourselves a Christian, but not leaning upon the one who actually makes us a Christian. Lord, we need you today. I've spoke to your people here even this morning and I've heard their cries. Literally been with some this morning who had tears that flowed. We need you, Lord. And you promised. So manifest yourself. Beginning with your word upon our hearts that you would amen in our spirit. Lord, let us yearn for you as you yearn for us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. He poured out His Spirit. In the King James, it says, the old King James, it says, He hath shed forth His Spirit. Can I be honest enough to tell you, I never really knew what that meant. He shed forth His Spirit. Just not the way we normally talk. I understand pour out, but really didn't understand fully what that meant in my own life. In the grammar, now I don't always do this, but I think it will help you when you understand this, that in the grammar in which this is, this is written, it is a primary preposition. It's a preposition denoting origin. Who it came from. It came from God. This is God Himself bestowing Himself. God the Father, God the Son, say it with me, God the Holy Spirit. This is the essence. It can, the, you can never take part of the Trinity out. Whenever you get God, you get all of God. Though Christ is the one who died for us, the Father was a part of that. The Spirit was with Him there. 
There's never a moment in life that we cannot have direct access to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, as it is initiated in us through His Holy Spirit. You don't get part of it. You get all of it. Now, this term poured out can really best be, in my understanding, understood as meaning gushed out. Now, some of y'all, a couple weeks ago, maybe some since then, had a pipe break. Y'all raise your hand if you had a pipe break. How many of you thought you had a pipe break? How many of you were afraid you had a pipe break? You don't want a pipe break, do you? But when you have a pipe break, guess what's going to happen? It is going to come out. It is going to gush. And you can, have you ever, if we see something broke, first thing we want to do is we want to put our hand on it like we're going to stop it. And then we realize that that's not going to work. Amen. We don't, we, we, we got to cut it off so that we can stop it from flowing so we can fix it. You don't need to cut out the gushing of the Holy Spirit because you're not going to fix him, but he can fix you. And he will, he, it's like a, a, a fountain that flows. As a matter of fact, let me just say it this way. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, the very last chapter in the very first verse, it talks about the throne in heaven. And it says, coming forth from the throne in heaven is a crystal clear river flowing out. The river of life, denoting the spirit of the living essence of God that flows in us and through us. We have the very fragrance of God because God lives within us and flows in us and through us. We need this. And if you get Christ, this is the bonus it talks about here, this being the very gift in verse 38, the very gift of the Spirit of God. Now, when the Holy Spirit lives within us and is poured out and is gushed out upon us, it is because He, by the faith of the Holy Spirit, by faith in the Holy Spirit, He comes to take control. He comes to take control. Now, let me see if I can speak about this for just a moment. When we're born into this world, we have a sinful nature. Have y'all ever heard that? We're born into sin and we live in sin. Nobody has to teach a child to sin. They know quite well how to do it. You don't have to teach a child to lie. They'll get into a circumstance and they'll just lie. You don't have to teach a child to steal. They'll see something that they want and they'll steal. They want to take control. Somebody will tell them something to do and they'll start to look around. Have you ever seen a two-year-old just look around at you and say, no? Then you want to lay hands on them in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Don't you tell me no. Right? You don't tell them. You say you don't have to say to them, hey, you need to be in control. We just want to be in control. And by the way, we like control. We're okay with what we are okay with. And we're not okay with anything that we're not okay with. We like control in our life. But the thing is, is it, it flows from a sinful nature. Now, when we make a decision to give Jesus Christ full reign in our life, we repent of our sins. We repent of our sinful ways. We, we give over control and we ask Jesus to take our lives. Now, what some people need to do is just be honest enough about it and say, I'll give you my sins, but I'm keeping the rest. I'll give you control over my problems, but I'm in control of everything else. Now, we would never say that, would we? But yet that's actually what happens. But the Spirit of God is there to bless you. It, the, the old nature battles against the Spirit of God when you ask Him in. The old control does not want to give up to Jesus being in control. But we must avail ourselves to the Spirit of God and let Him lead us and let Him guide us, let Him help us along the way. There is a, a verse in Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 9. The verse says this, The heart is deceitful above all things. 
deceitful, deceptive, above all things. And here's the problem. It's desperately wicked. And listen to this. Who can know it? The thing that we don't understand is that we need to get rid of this idea that we understand ourselves. You don't. You think you see yourself correctly. You don't. Let me just ask you. Do you understand yourself as much as God understands you? This says very plainly, the heart is deceitful. It will deceive you. Your heart that you're trusting in will deceive you. Above all things, it's desperately wicked. But we like it. We don't see it the way God sees it. Who can know it? You don't know yourself. And yet, we don't see our pride. We don't see our envy. We don't see our conceit. Matter of fact, the last conceit to go is this thing that we allow into our life of control. You don't know that you're being angry. You're just striking back. Somebody does something to you. Your human nature says, you get them back. They're rude to you. You're rude back to them. They snub you. You want to snub, be a snub right back to them. Somebody talks about you. It's before you even know it, before you can capture those words, you'll be saying something negative about them. That is the human will. And that is sinful. And by the way, we could go on all the time about this. Have you ever done something and looked back on it and thought, oh my goodness, did I really do that? Sure you have. We all do. We don't understand. But we're supposed to have the Christ life. How do we do that? He gives us the Spirit to allow us to see ourself. And when we do see ourself, oh Lord, I hope we're hearing this. You don't need another sermon. You don't just need somebody that will just give you another, another quick word. What we need to understand is that God wants to expose you to yourself so that you can see it and repent of it and give control over that area to Him. How many of you will believe this? You're living your life your way. You like what you like. You don't like what you don't like. And you're going to choose what you like. And you're going to choose what you think. And you're going to choose what you want. So you're going to live, come on, you're going to live your Christian life the way you feel. And you know that there's things in this thing that you're not living yet. Our problem is not what we don't know. Our problem is what we do know. That we're not living and if we're going to be one accord, we need to make sure that we're one accord with the Spirit of God. We need to make sure that we're one accord with His leadership and His guidance in our life. The help of what He wants to do in our life. You're good. You're good. No, you're fine. You're fine. Bless her heart, she looked up at me and she said, sorry. I wish we could all have that kind of a spirit, don't you? Just a kind, generous spirit. The thing about us is we're very, uh, we're very comfortable with God, what God is not comfortable with. And I could give you a hundred examples. And the thing is, is I have to battle these things just as much as you have to battle these things. How many of you want the will of God's will in your life? God's best. How many of you are willing to change? One day at a time. One issue at a time. That's why we have to get up every day and pray. That's why we have to get up every day and look in the Word. Because you're going to listen to the Spirit of God, to the Spirit of God. 
And as you listen to that Spirit of God, God's going to bring something up that He wants to, to do in your life that day. You need to be open to it. Open to the blessing of it. Open to what God can do. Our perceptions are going to be off when they are led by our own understanding. Let me show you an example here. Look what it says in verse 40. Acts 2 verse 40. With many other words, this is Peter, and he'd been preaching the message to these people who were not willing to change until this point in time. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them. He encouraged them, saying, Be saved for this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. How many of you understand that God wants to save souls? How many of you understand and know that God's the only one who can save souls? How many of you know that, that that's the very purpose of Christ coming and dying on the cross of Calvary? And for those of you who have received that, aren't you so grateful that He loved you and saved you? I love that word, to the uttermost. I love that. He saved me way beyond what I understand. And how many of you know that you are a missionary? That's your job. That's your privilege. That's what you get the opportunity to do, is you get the opportunity to, to share with Christ and talk about Christ in this world. But do we? I've heard people say, well, I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I can't do that. Then you listen to the Holy Spirit, you follow Him and lead Him, and He'll bring you and He'll push your comfort level a little bit at a time. And by faith, you're going to have to trust Him. By faith, you're going to have to let Him do something in your life. Look what it says here. With many other words, He testified. That's easy to do. That's just telling people what you know. And He exhorted them. He encouraged them. He loved these people. Can you love people? Can you talk to people about what Christ has done for you? Can you share with them how, how, how great things He wants to do in their life? Are you willing to brag on the one who brags on you? Are you willing to, 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 by faith, receive this? And the Holy Spirit will lead you to that person and maybe in a few words can just change everything. Yesterday I was in a store. There was a man, I just looked up and saw him. He said something and my initial reaction, before I even thought, my, re, my initial reaction was to say something about the Lord. I didn't even think about it. It just came. Now hear this and hear this well. Whenever I said that, something lit up in that man. And he needed that. And we began a conversation about it. That wasn't me. That was the Holy Spirit. I'm not bragging on me. I was just simply being used even when I didn't even realize I was being used. But somebody needed encouragement and we can do that along the way. Now, when you do it and you're not knowing you're doing it, that's good grammar, you're not knowing you're doing it, then that's okay. But if you know by the leading of the Holy Spirit that you should do it, are you still quiet? We have the process of giving over to God every day. And it's always in the most simplistic terms. By faith. Look in verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I like that word steadfastly. That means they continued on, not hot code, hot code, hot code. They said, this is what we need to do. And they were looking to the teaching that was given to them and the fellowship. Oh, we need fellowship. We need to be together. The breaking of bread. I don't fully understand but there's something about when people get together and they eat together that they just kind of relax and they can kind of connect with people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's important. This fellowship, breaking of bread, and they also prayed together. It's not, if we get 20 people together and I'm in the room and they say, well, we need to have a prayer. Preacher, will you pray for us? Now, I'm always good for prayer. I, I'm, not, I'm fine with that. Amen? But this is they prayed together. 
This is one person opening up to pray. Now that sounds simplistic, doesn't it? And then somebody will say, well, I, I, I'm embarrassed to pray in public, or I, I, don't, I don't want to be showy or anything. No, this is just the Christian life. Testifying, fellowshipping, learning together, praying together. I, I love prayer. I pray all the time. But you know what blesses me? I've heard my prayers. <laughs> what blesses me is hearing your prayers. I mean, it just, uh, a amen. Sometimes the, the glory bumps will come when I, when I hear somebody else just crying out before God. You see, there's something different about them. The Holy Spirit came in and they, they, they kind of just gave everything over. So whatever, listen, y'all say this word with me. Whatever, say it with me. Whatever the Holy Spirit led them to do, they, they just sought to do. They had never done this before. There were always priests out there that were showing them how to do it. But now they were involved in it. Every one of you is a missionary. Every one of you is a part of the Christian service. Every one of you is important to this great working of, a, of ourselves together. Let me keep going here. Verse 43. Fear came upon every soul. That word fear does not mean that they're afraid. It means to be in awe, in reverence. When Jesus taught them to pray, He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Honor, glory, reverence, respect, love. We, we give You praise, O oh God. You are the sovereign. You are the one that's over all. We have the great privilege of this. And when you stand in the presence of God, all comes over you. That's one of the things that happens in worship. That's why we need to have our prayers every day. That's why we need to have time with God. That's why we need to meet with other people. That's why we need to meet together as a church. Because there's a great awe of God that comes. It says that fear came upon every soul. And by the way, wonders and signs were done through the apostles. But they didn't get the praise for it. God did. God may have used them and worked through them, but it was not about making them feel good or pumping them up. If somebody gets a blessing from a song, praise God. If somebody hears a word from a sermon and it blesses them, praise God. It's the word. It's not Brian. It's in spite of Brian. Amen? I'm just here to, to, to speak forth, hopefully to encourage and exhort through the love of Christ. But that's what we all do together. We worship in awe and, and, and wonder, feeling His presence. Let's look on. Look in verse 44. All who believed were together and had all things in common, sold their possessions goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. <clears throat> we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? What else are we supposed to do? Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. We have the love for God and we, He gives us the love for each other. Right? Is it easy to take care of you? Is it easy to want for yourself? But when the Spirit of God is in you, you don't worry about those things. What you, you, you start to see people the way other people, the way God sees people. So you start seeing their cares. When they hurt, you hurt. When they're in need, you're there to help. It's not about you. We're missionaries together. So we take care of each other. We love each other. I um, need to confess something this week. Confession's good for the soul. I was on a trip this week and um, was in a restaurant and uh, my best friend and I were in a restaurant and I, I went and paid the bill and uh, I wanted to make sure that the waitress got the tip. So um, uh, I got the money at the register and, and I, I turned and I gave her her tip and I had 
some other money left in my hand. And a lady walked in the door of the restaurant and she said, uh, my granddaughter, my, my, my grandchild, my grandchild died. My grandchild was murdered. My grandchild was murdered. Does anybody want to help out? Um, and I'm standing there and I got this money in my hand. And she looked me dead in the eye and she said, my, my, my grandchild was murdered. You want to, anybody want to help me out? And I said, okay. And I gave her what I had in my hand. Now, I didn't pray about it. I didn't get an impulse about it. I didn't get a feeling about it. And, and, and people tell me, they say, well, you don't, you don't worry about that. That's, that's God. God will take care of that. And I, I, I agree with that. And I believe that. But I've learned and I've been trying to practice something for a while that I put money in my pocket that no longer belongs to me. And I wait for wh whomever comes, up, comes upon me. When the Lord says, give it to them, I don't argue with him. I don't fuss with him. It doesn't belong to me. I pull it out of my pocket and I give it to them. Okay? But I didn't do that. Out of Brian's guilt, I didn't want to look bad by putting that money back in my pocket. So I gave it to her. I didn't have any impulse of the Holy Spirit. And I didn't feel good about it. She may have been absolutely sincere. But I'm sitting here talking to you about we're supposed to be listening to the Holy Spirit and obedient to the Holy Spirit and not doing anything other than the Holy Spirit. And I just walked out in the flesh right there because I didn't want to be embarrassed. I didn't want to look bad by taking that money, putting it back in my pocket and going on. Now, since then, I had an opportunity. Well, it wasn't really. It was an opportunity. I wasn't even looking for an opportunity. But we drove by somebody who had that sign up. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And look, I work, I've worked with people in addiction since 1994. I don't like giving cash to somebody who may go out and do something bad with it. So I'm not going to give somebody cash just for the sake of giving somebody cash. But when the Lord tells you to do something, you do something. So I turned around. Didn't fuss with God. Obedient. By the way, I gave that person ten times more than I gave the other person. But I felt good about it. Not because it was ten times more. Because when the Spirit speaks, there's something that goes with that. And you give up your thoughts. You give up your ways. You, you willingly, freely, joyfully, with peace, join God in whatever that is. Lance said, told me this morning, he said, I saw somebody walk into a store and they came out with a beautiful woman. He said, I wonder what kind of store. That was a great store. They came out with a beautiful woman. And then he said, um, he said, then I watched him and he was talking about me and Lynn. And Lynn had a hold of my arm and uh, we walked to the truck and I opened the door for her. And she got in the truck and he said, you're practicing what you're preaching. And I'm like, well, I always open the door for my wife. All you men who don't open the doors for your women, shame on you. And if they tell you, don't open my door for me, you open it anyway. Teach them. You do it when nobody's watching. You do it because it's the right thing to do. What would the church look like if we actually adopted this thought of being one accord with God? Not just in here, but being open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit to do whatever, whenever, however, to whoever, it doesn't matter. Just the automatic yes of the Lord. I've had people look at this and they say, so we're supposed to take everything that we have and sell it and give it away. No. But you better do it if the Lord tells you to. So we're supposed to go out and witness on the street to everybody that comes by. 
go ahead. But if you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, something good will come from it. If you're doing it in the flesh, you're just going to get cold. We're supposed to feed the community. That's a good thing. But do it when God tells you and how he leads you. Say yes at the beginning of the day to whatever he leads you to do. If he tells you to feed the poor, if that's the ministry you're supposed to have, do it with all your heart. When Rhonda came to me in the spring and said, I have this feeling that we need to give out Bibles to people in this community. I didn't argue with her. I didn't talk her out of that. I said, amen. And you know what we did? We sent out a thousand Bibles. By the way, we have someone here this morning who received one of those Bibles. Y'all hear me? Who didn't know anything about us. By the way, in their particular circumstance, they shouldn't have even opened it up, but they did. And they have received a blessing and they've been a blessing by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. You're not smart enough to come up with a way to, to do the things of God. And I'm not. So for the last year, I've been doing my dead level best to listen. Listen. I want to listen to you because I ask you to listen to me. And when you're prompted by God, I'll join. And when we're prompted by the word, we can come together in one heart and one accord. But don't think for a skinny second that God's going to say, you do your best and I'll bless it. He'll anoint what he instigates. All we have to do is say yes to him. Now he'll honor that. I'm not smart enough to come up with those things. And I'm supposed to be a leader. I understand that. And whatever we church do together, whatever the Word of God says that we're to do, and we're joining this Word, I will give it my 100% effort. And I'll lead in that direction. I'll do everything I can. Lastly, look what it says in verse 46. So continuing daily... With one accord in the temple, that's meeting together, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We don't understand ourselves, but the Holy Spirit does. We don't know what we need to do, but the Holy Spirit will help us. He will lead us. He will guide us. He will empower us. He will limit us. And He will bless us. Souls being saved. Lives being touched. I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be a part of that. Everybody wants to be where the Holy Spirit's gushing out. It's exciting. It's fun. I love seeing tears when there are tears that are there because of God's working. We need to be, church, one accord. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to be in one accord. One accord with God, one accord with each other, one accord as missionaries on mission. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, the first step is repenting of your control, your way, and giving not only your sins, giving your life to Him. If you ask Him, well, matter of fact, it says right here, in uh, verse number um, 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 